Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled 1001 Windmills of the Mind. This is a collection of quotes taken from what's called the psychodynamic or the psychoanalytic perspective, which long ago used to be called philosophical medicine because these types of uh, ideas and quotes and speculations and theories and and jargon around it. They're an attempt to heal memories. They're an attempt to unpick the threads of a traumatic, a childhood traumatic script and use those threads to weave a new healthier script. These types of quotes are helping us to be our own existential detective so that we can be our own caring witness. Grief is healed when it's witnessed by a caring other these quotes are giving us the knowledge and understanding of what we're witnessing to, to understand uh, ourselves. Yeah. So the, these quotes, um, for example, they help us to link something that uh, might be concerning us in the present, a recurring pattern that we think is dysfunctional, to find out when it started in childhood, and to realize that it, that when something's painful in childhood, there's what's called repetition compulsion to try to get a better outcome. So the person keeps repeating the childhood scene in symbolic form again and again in the throughout their lives, and that, that becomes a pattern. But it's like Sisyphus; it can't be. It doesn't work. He can't get a better outcome. So the person is caught in this repetition compulsion. And then to see how that pattern is being uh, enacted in the present, in the here and now with another person. So to make a link like that, a person's chief general complaint in life, when it started, and then to see it in the here and now. See, that that's like creating a mirror. And then a person can get an, an emotional insight and realize that now that he understands it, uh, he can use his rational mind to make new choices and... and um, you know, weave a new script, and so on. Right. Um, so, uh, this collection of quotes um, of the psychoanalytic perspective, we now have over seventeen hundred quotes, and these seven and these seventeen hundred plus quotes are um, they're all interlinked and related, but generally speaking, we can sort of group them into over thirty themes or topics or threads that run throughout the series of quotes. So for example, we have a thread on symbiosis. When the baby's born, he needs um, to get his symbiotic needs met. When he was in the womb, he got his needs automatically met from the mother while in the womb. But when he's born, he enters into the extended womb for the first four to five months seven at the latest. The range is three to seven months. Mahler says, on average, the extended womb is from four to five months. So during that time, the child needs to get his symbiotic needs met. We have a whole thread about this topic, a major thread, um, a very difficult thread, and it's been covered. Uh, we've covered it in these videos. If a child uh, doesn't get his symbiotic needs met, it can lead to a certain personality pattern or patterns, rather. We have a thread on uh, unconscious guilt. If the child uh, doesn't get his needs met, uh, he, he thinks that maybe the mother didn't love him. Because of the pain he feels by not getting his needs met, he may conclude that there's something wrong with him, that he's no good. Now, because of the fusion with the mother, and to preserve an attachment with the mother, he may do it to himself, so he may recreate situations where he's disappointed just to remain attached to the mother, because the theory is the baby needs enough love from the mother to leave the mother, but if he's not getting enough love to leave her, he's stuck, he's stuck there. Now, to preserve the loyalty and the attachment to the mother, he does to himself what his mother did to him. So if the mother rejected him, he then rejects himself, and he does so by creating situations and disappointments uh, he can coax others to disappoint them, or he can choose in advance people who are going to disappoint him because he wants to feel 
uh, the rejection again that he got. So he's stuck like Sisyphus, repeating the unconscious guilt. Another major uh, thread that we've covered recently, right? um, that was a very interesting video from a few weeks ago about unconscious guilt. Major topic. One of the most important topics, I think, this one there. We have another thread on uh, identification with the aggressor. Sometimes the child can't take the pain of being unloved, so he identifies with the aggressor. Meaning, if the baby inter interprets mother's unavailability as him being rejected, okay, so again, if the mother's on the phone for too long, remember the baby has no concept of the passage of time. He doesn't understand that maybe in five minutes the mother's going to attend to him. He's terrified in the moment. He thinks the mother might abandon him. He, he feels persecutory anxiety. Right? Now he can't hold on to that. Um, if this is a, a chronic pattern with the mother, the child might think uh, he'll just be like her then. So the child thought that the mother rejected him. He identifies with the aggressor. Later in life, he rejects others in order to communicate that when he was a child, he was rejected. Okay, So... Um, what he's doing is he's creating a mirror. When he reject, when he's devaluing towards others with his negative humor and sardonic humor and shaming humor and um, finding excuses and um, and not caring about it and just is fixated on uh, saying how bad they are, that's like creating a mirror for him to see, for him to realize that when he was a baby, his mother was negative towards him. Okay. So that's called identification with the aggressor. Uh, Burglar calls it a negative magic gesture. You're trying to communicate what your childhood was like by creating this mirror of doing to others what your mother did to you to communicate and to see what your mother did to you. Okay, so that this is another key important uh, thread in this series, identification with the aggressor. That often leads, that uh, is sort of the core, one of the core components of the narcissistic pattern. Right. They devalue others because they want to communicate that when they were a child, their mother devalued them. And then they hide it, of course, with rationalizations. So that's another thread in this series, rationalizations, where you want to, be, you want to give the appearance of being rational, but you're not. You're lying, uh, so you use uh, pseudo-logic, fake logic, to lie to yourself and to lie to others that your prejudice uh, is reasonable. That's, but him doing that, he's not aware, in that case, he's not aware that he's creating a mirror for him to see that he was unloved by his mother. Nobody wants to admit that. That's why he won't look in the mirror. So he's fixated on saying how bad the other person is. What he's doing is he is creating a mirror to communicate that his mother unloved him so immensely that he felt that he was so bad. That's why he's saying others are so bad, because he feels so bad, unloved. So that's uh, another thread in this series, the theory about how we create mirrors. Okay. Our repetition compulsion, projection, prejudice, the narcissistic pattern, identification regress, negative magic, a lot of the things that we uh, do are actually a mirror for us to see our childhood. Projection is the means of bringing repressed material to consciousness. Repetition, compulsion, doing to others what the mother did to you, to communicate what your mother did to you, that's like creating this mirror. It's like this drama you're creating on the outside, like a, on a theater stage. And you're, now you look at the theater stage, right? So that's like a mirror for you to see that that's what your mother did to you. So that's one of our threads about this idea of the mirror. Lachlan calls it the mirror defense. And so projection, externalization, and so on. That's a means of bringing repressed material to consciousness because the psyche, because there's an, an innate drive for wholeness. Right? The psyche is trying to heal us. So that's sort of the positive intention of all this. And we're meant to cooperate with the soul, with the psyche, that's helping us to try to heal. So it's getting us to see what our childhood was like through our behavior. By our behavior, we're 
creating this mirror for us to see our behavior, to realize what our mothers did to us. All right. Again, projection is the means. So projection means something you don't know about yourself. It's denied. Okay. Then you then you attribute this material outwardly and say it belongs to them or that or this. Or they think that. They believe that. They're doing this. And uh, look how bad they are. This is like a mirror. Okay. You look in the mirror and you see that it's within. So projection is the means of bringing repressed material to consciousness. Okay. So those are two more of our threads, rationalization and um, the mirror defense. Uh, projection in, a, in of itself is a major thread in this series. Right. How we attribute things that we don't know about ourselves to others. Um, and how that preserves the repression. So projection is there to distract us from what we're, what we're repressing. Repression means something was too painful, we can't feel it, it's denied. And we want to keep it denied because it's too painful to feel. Right? The baby feeling persecutory anxiety or abandonment depression can't feel that. The scream, the, the painting, the scream, the munch, the baby can't feel that. It's repressed, it's denied, it's voiceless. Someone called it uh, in the song here. Maybe we'll play it at the end here. We have a song here by, Delir by, the, by the band Delirium. He calls it the, the voiceless scream or something. Screaming silence or something like that. The voiceless scream, the screaming. That's what the baby, that's too painful. So the way to deal with that pain, to keep it repressed, hidden, camouflaged, is to create this distraction. Okay, The distraction is you say it's outward. You blame them. So blaming is a mirror for what's within. Yeah. So blaming is a mirror. Yeah. Um, we have a, a thread on um, emotional eating. Uh, we, we did a very good video recently, I think, about that. We covered some good ground on that. A difficult topic. Woodman says, if you can understand emotional eating, that can be a pathway to healing. That's one doorway to healing. Focusing on the, um, the issue around food. That, that's a big topic right there. A huge one. We have a thread on the psychology of prejudice. And that's another major one. Um, and there's a sub-thread related to that thread on the sociological factors that contribute to prejudice. And along that sub-thread the sociological sub-thread, we have a variety of sort of little facets, uh, little pearls that string from that thread um, that, uh, that are facets of the sociological side to, um, to prejudice. For example, the psychology of religion. That's one of the um, aspects of the sociological side. Right? Propaganda, religion, uh, the economic system that was born 10,000 years ago out of the panic that we felt uh, if the, if uh, when we discovered farming. That's another topic. All of those are major topics in of themselves. We have a thread on the psychology of myths and fairy tales. They're metaphors for the traumatized psyche. Because in a myth or fairy tale, you always have a goddess or a demon. Okay? That goddess is a fantasized personification, a metaphor, an image. So the baby thinks in images. That's an image of when the baby felt loved. When he felt loved, the breast was this divine, heavenly, soothing, beautiful, wonderful being. That's the goddess. When the breast was unavailable or rejecting or the mother was misattuned or used the bottle or the timing was wrong or she was aggressive, uh, the baby was hurt by that, that's the demon. Yeah. So we have goddess and demon. That means the breastfeeding um, went, went wrong. It goes wrong when the frustration outweighs the love, then the splitting is being used. Now that's a very major key thread throughout this series, this issue of splitting. Um, I, I'm not going to try to summarize it here. But uh, the basic idea is that um, 
in order for the baby to feed properly he has to think or hallucinate that the mother is so wonderful then he can eat he can feed even if the mother is rejecting and doing it rudely and badly so in reality he's bonded to the to the frightening image of the rejecting mother but he thinks he's bonded to the good mother that's splitting it's a it's a trick of the mind he's lying to himself but he's a genius to figure out a way to survive when the mother's being so rejecting the baby couldn't feed if if he's so stressed out right so he hallucinates that the breast is good even though he's terrified by it now he's bonded to the terrifying breast mother but he thinks he's bonded to the good mother now now if this doesn't get sorted out by the age of three okay so in other words normally by the age of three this all gets sorted out the baby gets that the breast is mostly loving but sometimes disappointing and that's okay and he can handle that ambivalence he can handle that ambivalence it's okay now he's able to handle that ambivalence if the love with the mother outweighs the frustration with the mother then the baby can get a concept of the mother as an ordinary person mostly loving sometimes frustrating and that's okay that's normal that's called whole object relations that leads to the psychological birth and healthy development and I'm okay you're okay and so on but if the frustration with the mother outweighs uh, the love with the mother, the baby still uses the splitting defense mechanism. And huge consequences by that. Right? As described and depicted in myths and fairy tales. So myths and fairy tales describe the traumatized psyche of when the mother was more frustrating than loving. Major thread. Wow, you know... Um, I think if, uh, if if this concept of the psychological defense mechanism or a maneuver of the mind called the splitting defense um, could be better appreciated and understood, I think that that's uh, I think that would make immense contributions to self understanding and self knowledge. One therapist says that's all he does is try to heal the splits. He calls himself. Um, a coach on how to help his clients to be their own metaphorical alchemist. Because if you can heal the splits, meaning you recognize that you're bonded to the frightening mother, you accept that she was more rejecting than loving, then you detach from that, but that's painful. But that gives you a perspective of the mother being partly loving but mostly frustrating. Through your understanding, you want to bring the two sides together. Now you're creating a whole concept of the mother. As an ordinary flawed woman, confused, troubled, confused young mother who didn't know what she was doing, and you forgive her, now you're seeing the mother as an ordinary person. The image in the fairy tale is a pillow. Humans use pillows. Right? Under the pillow, there's a key. So when you create this pillow, meaning this concept of the mother as an ordinary person, and you, and you can forgive her and understand that and accept her as a, as a, as a flawed woman who did her best, or as a woman who would have done her best if she weren't so confused, you somehow get to a place where you can accept it. Then you realize there's a key under the pillow. Now that key, okay, so Robert Bly's metaphor is that um, there's our golden ball is in the cage, and the cage is locked. You need the key. Where's the key? It's under the pillow. So that key opens the cage, and then you get your golden ball. That's your feeling self, your vitality, your connection to yourself, your aliveness, your happiness, um, feeling alive. Sometimes it's the fire bird, the aliveness of affect. The fire bird, see the image there? It's, it's your, your, you're alive, you're radiant. Um, so um, that's the idea of the alchemist, uh, the golden ball, right? Your painful memories. Uh, can lead to you ultimately to getting your golden ball so that's the lead to the gold the metaphor right so a major thread of a splitting splitting precludes mourning if the child can't bring the two sides of the mother together if the person still thinks in his unconscious fantasies that the concept of the other is either all great or all bad goddess and demon perspective um, that prevents that precludes mourning you see, what, what happens is, 
Rinsley's, Masterson, Rinsley, Mahler, and many others say that the baby needs what's called a secure attachment style. If the baby has a secure attachment style, meaning the love outweighs the frustration, they achieve whole object relations, that's the psychological structure, the psychic structure needed to be able to mourn losses. Right? Because whole object relations implies getting the key out from under mother's pillow. It means you have ontological security, a sense of self, right? you have the internalized good object, the holding interject, you have that kind of inner support within you. That allows you the strength to mourn losses. Splitting, you see, um, that means you don't have the pillow, that's the key, that's the ability to mourn losses. Splitting prevents mourning. If a person doesn't mourn losses in their life, that can lead to pathological nostalgia, melancholia, complicated grief, aggravated grief, chronic sorrow, soul loss, burnout, nervous breakdown, stress on stress. It can, it can snowball. It can lead to the symptoms of PTSD, delayed onset of developmental trauma. That's PTSD. And that can lead to, as one person said, to becoming a curmudgeon late in life. Miserly, bitter, stingy, you know, the Scrooge. Very bitter and angry because he's still in angry battle with the mother. The curmudgeon is still waiting for his mother's love and he's not getting it. So that's why he's so angry. Everything disappoints him. Everything is symbolic mother for him. And he's always disappointed, and he's always angry at the mother, and, and, it, and it snowballs, and, and it takes longer to recover, and he's getting older, uh, time's running out, and he's trying harder, and, and he's stuck like Sisyphus, so he becomes a miser miserly person. He never healed the splits, right? He never got to the point where he accepted the painful reality that the mother was unavailable to love him, even though she meant well and tried, but the reality is she didn't. He never considered that possibility. That's a very painful thing. Steiner says, it's this verdict of reality that makes the work of mourning so painful and difficult. Nobody wants to admit it. Nobody wants to admit that their mother didn't love them properly. Yeah. I know. I, I, I have a hard time even just saying it, you know, um, because of, I anticipate the reaction that people might have when they hear something like that. But a lot of, there's, we have many quotes that make reference to this point. So I feel supported by the many authors in this collection that notice this. There's a huge resistance to the idea that the mother, despite her best intentions, was more frustrating at the breastfeeding during the first three years than loving. That leads to another one of our major threads in this series. We have some very important uh, threads in this series. It's called the Jocasta style of mothering. Oh boy. <laughs> Maybe we'll just take a little breather here for a sec. Hold on a sec. How are we doing outside? A little rain. Yeah, the snow's melting already. So one of one of our most difficult, another difficult thread in this series is called the Jocasta style of um, mothering. And uh, the intro to that is the, the self-help slogan, mothers are there to meet uh, the needs of the baby, not the other way around. If it is the other way around, that's called the Jocasta style of mothering. So just very, in a nutshell, just very quickly, it's as if the mother says to the baby, uh, look baby, when I was a, a baby myself, I didn't get a secure attachment style, and I'm in battle with my mother in the mind. So the mother in the mind, that's like a phantom or a ghost, these memories, right? We're talking about memories. So this young mother says to her new baby, um, sorry, baby, uh, when I was a, a child myself, I didn't get a secure attachment style. And I want to show my mother in the mind what she did to me. And I'm going to do it to you because I want to show her what she did to me. 
Sorry, baby. I'm stuck in the repetition compulsion of being in this battle with this phantom in my mind. I'm still waiting for her love. I want her to apologize. I'm so enraged at her and I'm consumed by this rage at her that I'm going to do to you what my mother did to me because I'm trying to finally get her to recognize it. I want to show my anger uh, at my mother somehow. I want to show her up. So burglar says she wants to show her up. Right? That's an expression of her anger at her mother. Sorry, baby, I can't give you that secure attachment style that you need. Okay, this links to our other threat called intergenerational trauma. Okay, so this repetition compulsion of passing down the insecure attachment style is uh, one theory around what's behind intergenerational trauma. Okay, so the Jacosta style of mothering might be based on that. Right? She can't love the baby because she's so busy rejecting the baby to show the mother in the mind. Look, mother in the mind, you see how I'm rejecting your grandchild? Well, that's what you did to me and I didn't like it and I want you to see it. And she's stuck like that. It's not going to change. Nothing's going to happen. This phantom in the this memory image, this phantom ghost, is not going to fly out of the woman's mind, travel to wherever the mother is, living or in the ground. Let's say she's living. The phantom flies into the nursing home, wherever she is, and explains what happened. And uh, this mother says, oh my God, did I... Did I really do those things to my child? Oh, I feel awful now. Oh my, what can I do to make it up? I know what I'll do. I'll invent a time machine. Yes, I'll read a manual. I'll invent a time machine. Oh, there, here's my time machine. I'm going to fly to my daughter. Here, daughter, hop into this time machine. We're going to go back to the nursery. They fly back. They morph back to their original roles. So that young mother becomes the baby in the crib. Uh, this, her mother becomes the young mother. She breastfeeds properly, meets the baby's needs, does everything right, changes the past, changes history, changes it all. And now that, okay, she, now they're healthy. So that woman becomes healthy. They fly back in the time machine, come back into the present, and they cured it. And then that young mother can say, oh, you know what? I was loved. I can give you love now. Now that fantasy is a mirror. Okay, again, back to the mirror. When we have these fantasies, that's like creating a mirror for us to know what our childhood was like. So that's a secondary delusion. Um, this negative magic gesture of rejecting the baby to communicate to your mother in the mind that uh, you didn't like how you, you were rejected by her and you're showing her through your behavior, through this negative magic gesture, that's a very painful thing. It's not going to work. The young mother is not going to get an apology from her mother or change the past. All she's doing is passing on the trauma to her child, intergenerational trauma. And that child is going to grow up uh, with that pain. So that's called the Jocasta style of mothering. Right? And the child feels um, very rejected by the mother because of that. The more rejecting the mother is, Fairy Baron explains, the more the baby needs the mother, the more the baby clings to the mother, the more the baby becomes just like her, identifies with her, becomes fused with her, and is stuck in the tar pit of a negative symbiosis with that mother. You see? And that can lead to certain personality patterns out of that, including the narcissistic pattern and others. So that's one way the Jocasta style of mothering can take place. Another version of the Jocasta style of mothering, a very common one, is that when the mother gets the baby, the mother says, at last, somebody is going to meet my needs, is going to listen to me and respond to me and, and give me respect and do consideration and answer me when I have a need and be at my beck and call. Because when that mother was a child, she didn't get those things from her mother. Now she's going to parentify her baby and try to get it from her baby. Okay, That's called childhood parentification. Now the poor baby's going to do their best. They're going to do, yes, the baby's going to want to be perfect and a goodest. Sarno calls it a goodest and a perfectionist to please the mother. And the mother will, okay, good. Now my child is mirroring me and doing, and the baby does what I say and, and my wishes, they're there and they need, and, uh, and they're always there. 
So the mother is going to manipulate, brainwash. Uh, Shen Gold calls it soul murder. Um, another one calls it rape of the mind. It was, it's an awful thing to say. Uh, was it, what's his name? Mer Lu. That's a tough book to read. I don't like it. And there are other very disturbing, there are other very disturbing terms for this psychic in, psychic incest, the emotion. Right? So the mother is overly engulfing, overly impinging. Those those are the more easier ways of describing it. I don't like these more extreme terms, but they come up a lot in the jargon. So I kind of like, I feel like I'm bothered by it. So sometimes I say it because I'm, I'm bothered by some of these terms. But what happens is the mother is engulfing, impinging, demanding onto the baby. Now the baby loses his real self. Now the baby's real self becomes the hungry, enraged, empty part self, or the despised self, the shamed self, the humiliated self, the unloved self. That's too painful. That gets repressed. Now what does the baby have left? All he has left is what's called the grandiose part self. All children have what's called the grandiose part self. The grandiose part self is sometimes called primary narcissism, meaning all children think up until the age of 18 months that it's all about them. The baby in the womb, it's all about them. In the extended womb, it's all about them. And up to 18 months, that continues. In normal, natural, healthy development, that primary narcissism dissipates. But if there's trauma before 18 months, and there will be, with, with the Jocasta style of mothering, there's going to be, uh, then the, all that person has is the grandiose part self. Now, their, that grandiose part self is fused with the fake image of the mother as being omnipotent. Remember, she's the giantess in the nursery. So this concept of the other is this grand, powerful thing. And they're fused with that. Okay, So the ideology, the psychic structure of the person with the narcissistic pattern is that they simultaneously can flip back and forth where they believe it's all about them. That's the grandiose part self. And they're so important. That's the mother being so grand and powerful. And they think they're like that. They're so important. It's all about them. Right? The mother devalued them. So they're going to devalue others to communicate that the mother devalued them. And they're so important. And they made it happen. That's the grandiose part self. So they're preserving the grandiose part self by putting others down. They're preserving what's left of them. They've rejected the, the unloved self. The unloved self is seen onto others and they put others down. You see? That's creating a mirror for them to see what their mother did to them. They hurt other people's true self. That's a mirror for them to say their mother hurt their true self. Again, their true self is repressed. When something's repressed, it gets the, the psyche seeks wholeness. The psyche says to the person, look how that other person is no good. Yeah, that person's no good. So then you say that and you put them down. That's creating a mirror for you to see that your mother put you down. So that's sort of the positive intention of this repetition compulsion and identification with the aggressor. Okay, so that's the Jocasta style of mothering. We're not blaming the mother. Um, we're, we're trying to forgive her. We're trying to forgive her because the mother herself was stuck, was trapped in her existential net. In her, She was caught in her existential dilemma. She didn't get a secure attachment style and she's stuck in the repetition compulsion of being in the battle with the mother in her mind. Or she's desperately trying to get her needs met by, by um, parentifying her baby to get the baby to be a breast mother to her, to serve her and take care of her and comfort her, soothe her. The baby is used as a teddy bear for her to comfort her. Right? And, the and the poor baby tries, they try their best. It can't be done. It's called failed empathy. The baby can't do it, but he's going to try, and he's going to spend the rest of his life being perfect and good, still trying to do it. Yeah. That can lead to this video here about uh, the distress leading to bodily symptoms as a distraction. So that's Jocasta style of mothering. We have the Elias complex. If the mother has a son, okay, if she's doing this to a boy, uh, he ends up with the mother complex. So if the mother devalued him, he's going to devalue others. 
Uh, we have a good example of that, of the mother complex, in, this, in the comic Psychoanalysis. 1955, four episodes of this comic called Psychoanalysis was produced. It's been reprinted and bound, so, so the complete collection, all four episodes are bundled up into this book. They're all here. And uh, this book covers a total of 12 therapy sessions. Three with Freddie, four with Ellen. She's on the couch there. Four with her and five with Mark. That third one there, okay, he was a mama's boy. His mother devalued him and then he devalued women. Okay, so he had a mother complex. If you want to, if you want to understand the mother complex, uh, read the story about Mark. By the way, this is a serious uh, comic. It's not some frivolous thing. It's meant, it's, it's an educational tool to teach psychoanalysis. This is the best introduction to psychoanalysis there is. So, so, he, so he has the mother complex. Now if, he, now if he has a son, let's say he has a son himself, he's going to reject, he might reject the son to communicate that his mother rejected him. That means he has the Elias complex, another thread. Now, if the mother has a daughter, and the daughter's caught in the negative tar pit with the mother, she has an electric complex. Anybody who betrays their feelings, they have the Agamemnon complex. And we have a few others. We, uh, one of our threads in this series is the story of Orestes. He's the brave hero who confronted the mother. He's the one that said, Yes, I get it now. My mother wasn't loving. I'm angry. So he expressed his anger. So the metaphor of the story of Orestes is that he separated from the mother. He faced the persecutory anxiety. Okay, so the, the fantasy personification of that, of those feelings is are the Furies. So the Furies were there. He faced it and he succeeded. He separated from the mother. Athena, the psyche, said, okay, he did it. So he's... Uh, a true hero for being able to say mother I didn't like how you raised me I'm very angry at that now the mother's gonna deny it and shame him and use guilt oh look what I did for you how can you be so ungrateful and you lay all these guilt trips he says no you you're um, misguided you did it wrong you may not believe it but you 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 uh, did all these things and it hurt and I'm angry and he's gonna feel the threat that the mother's gonna reject him to try to control him, to hook him back in. And he says no. Okay, so he resisted the sirens. So that voice of being hooked back in, okay, one metaphor of that is the, the sirens. Another thread in this series. So this is um, Odysseus there. So Odysseus, okay, is saying, no, I'm not going to get hooked back in. I want to find myself. I'm going to separate from you. The siren says, no, just just stay a mama's boy. Be a, play, be a playboy. You can devalue others to communicate how I devalued you. I just want you to stay bonded to me. He says, no, I want to find myself. I'm an individual person. I'm a person of my own right. I want to find my feelings. I want to find my golden ball. I want to find the fire bird. I want to find Penelope. She's a symbol of my feelings. I want to be united with myself. I'm not going to listen to your sweet temptation. Yes, it's very sweet to go back that way. So, uh, so another thread in our series is the story of the Odyssey. Okay, it's sort of a continuation of Orestes. So there are heroes, right? Orestes and Odysseus are two of our heroes. So these quotes are helping us to be Orestes and Odysseus. We have to separate from the mother. It's gonna be. It's gonna emotionally feel scary to do it because because it brings up the memories of how we didn't get her love, and we and normally we can't leave a mother if we didn't get her love. The condition is first you get the love, then you feel basic trust within yourself and security within yourself, uh, a sort of a internal reservoir within yourself. Then you can go on on your own. If you don't get that, you're still waiting for it. Now, Orestes and Odysseus didn't get it, but they're, so that's called a hero's journey. Okay, it can take 20 years at midlife, 40 to 60 on average, they say. All right, so that's um, another couple of our threads in this series, the stories of uh, Orestes and Odysseus. Okay, 
um, and some of those complexes. The Sisyphus story, the narcissist, the story of narcissists, the code of, okay. We have threads on various personality patterns, the Iago story. The Iago, he's the guy that behind the scenes um, spreads rumors and gets others against themselves, and he enjoys the show. Now that Iago story, by the way, is presented here with Freddy. He was on the verge to becoming Iago because he was stressed out by the father. He was stressed out by the mother. The only time he felt any kind of relief, meaning pleasure, was when he got them to argue amongst themselves. He felt better. And he was stuck there. He spent his whole life thinking that the only way he knows how to get pleasure is to get others against themselves. So he, he had... Huge envy, huge schadenfreude. Um, he never got any of the love. Love and gratitude have not entered the psychological picture for Freddy or Iago. They're just filled with envy, spite, vindictiveness. You see. So we have a thread on the Iago character. A thread on the hostile, provocative attachment style. If the baby didn't get their symbiotic needs, all they think is um, about power and control. It's a jungle, power, survival. The baby would rather have a negative symbiosis with the mother, okay, than no connection with the mother. So a person with the hostile, provocative attachment style, they didn't get their symbiotic needs. So they're going to create a negative symbiosis with someone else. They're going to find some lackey to terrorize, force that person to be at their beck and call, and convert that person into their breast mother. Now it's negative. They're not happy doing that. It's never going to change to a positive version of it. it can't, it's impossible. No person in the present can be the breast mother. They can't travel back in a time machine and change it all. But he's, but the bully pattern uh, would rather, the baby, the traumatized baby would rather have a negative abusive mother or rejecting mother than no mother. So he's recreating that in some way. This time he's more active about it instead of being passive. But it's the same thing. So his philosophy is just power and control because he wants the lackey to always be there. The baby wants the breast mother to be there, even though it's negative and he can't separate. And he can't leave the lackey. If the lackey leaves, he'll find someone else. See, he's very dependent on the negative mother. So he's forcing others to play the role of negative mother. That's a major threat. The hostile, provocative attachment style, the bully pattern. And uh, how they, they only think about power and control and, and the philosophy around it and the rationalization around it, um, that it's a jungle. That rationalization is a lie to hide the fact that they don't want to face the truth that they didn't get their symbiotic needs met. When they were born, the mother used the bottle or the schedule. That'll do it. He didn't get it. Yeah. Or sometimes... Or he was prematurely ejected out of the symbiotic egg before five months. Sometime before five months, he was prematurely ejected out of the symbiotic egg or the psychological egg. Another thread in our series, this concept of the egg, the psychological egg. Okay, so when the baby's, so the biological birth, uh, that took place in a couple of seconds. He enters into this social symbiosis. It's kind of like an egg for the psychological birth to take place at three. First, he needs that egg. When he's loved there, then he can begin to hatch out. But this hatching out process is gradual from five months to 36 months. And there are various sub-phases described by Mahler and others. That's called object developmental relations. Object developmental theory and object relations theory discusses this process another thread in our series we have a thread on the closet narcissistic pattern by Masterson we have a thread on the codependent pattern their fix their their fixation their arrested development took place between 15 months and 36 months they're the clingers and the, and the hopeless romantics and uh, very self-sacrificing and always serving others and they think they're no good and others are so great. They're stuck there. 
Natural development is I'm okay, you're okay, mutuality, you see. Um, oh, hold on a sec, I hear a, I, I think there's a, I think there's a, no. You know, it's fun doing these videos outdoors because if a bird flies by, I can show you some birds. We, we saw a heron once and um, we saw the Canada geese once. Lots of seagulls and crows, a few blue jays. Um, but, um, but, you know, I can hear some crows pecking on the roof here. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, okay. <laughs> Hold on a sec, let me scare off these crows. They're a little distracting. Hold on a sec. <laughs> okay, hopefully that worked. Okay. <laughs> the crows are very wise birds. I, I think they're very conscious. Um, they're very intelligent birds. Whenever a baby crow accidentally flies down the flume into the basement, oh, he's still there. Um, and, uh, hold on a sec. Okay. <laughs> Whenever, um, a baby f uh, f uh, crow uh, flies down uh, the flume, the chimney, they go down into the basement and they fly out of the wood stove, the doors open, and they fly up to the ground floor into the mud room and they trap themselves into the mud room and they're flying back and forth between the basement and the mud room. And sometimes the crows make a commotion around me. And I thought, oh my goodness, what's this commotion with the crows? They're trying to tell me that their buddy is trapped in the mud room. And I go, oh my God, now it's a pattern. On occasion when that happens, I, I go to the mud room, open the door and the crow flies out and he is joined by his buddies that were telling me about the situation and they all fly off together like that. So they're very, uh, well, those, those crows are pretty stubborn. They're gonna stay there, aren't they? Okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's a sign for me to move on. Um, so those are a few of our, um, threads in this series. Wow. Hold on a sec. Let's try one more time. Hey! Psh, psh, psh. You know, it might be the mouse. You know, it might be the mouse. Huh? If it's the mouse, no, they're not gonna... <laughs> Got a mouse in. We got a mouse in the house. Okay. <laughs> Apparently, they're, they're hiding. We have a few foxes, so they're they're afraid of the foxes. So they they hide in houses. Apparently. Okay. Um, sorry for the distraction there. And there are other threads. So those are a few of our threads in this series. Why don't we take like a little musical break here? Here's a little two minute new age song. Let's just take a little brief musical break here. This is called um, Sedona Reprise. It's just an ambient song, instrumental. I'll just take a little break here. I'll show you some show you some photos 
in the meantime. I don't know if you can see these. So this is Art and Love. Okay, Metropolitan Museum of um, Art. You see it okay? Oh yeah, we saw this one already. This is the, the Picasso one. Vincent van Gogh, 1890. It's called First Steps. See, the first, that's a two-person psychology, right? The child and the mother, that's a two-person psychology, right? And then now he's a connection with the father, that's going to be a three-person psychology. So this is normal development. The child is going to learn about the world. The father is going to expand the child's understanding of the world, right? And as mentioned in a previous video, is the, if there is a trauma, if there are difficulties between there, the child might have over expectations of the father. The child may project the needs for a good mother onto the father, but he can't do it. So the child may be very angry at the father, but he can't make up for what the mother failed to do, you see. He can to some degree, of course, but... Yeah, I'll play it again. What do you think of that new one? That's a new one. I just found it the other day. Let's, let's, play it a, let's play it a couple of times. Hold on a second. It's interesting, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's new. It's ambient, fused with a sort of a blues rock, sort of like a blues guitar. I don't know. Okay, I'm just... Taking a break here a little bit. Hold on. Okay. Yeah, you know, I'm really, honestly speaking, I'm very disappointed with this book because a lot of the photos, a lot of the paintings, they're just sort of dreary portraits, you know. It's supposed to be a love, it's supposed to be a book about love, right? <laughs> oh, now here's a good one. Okay, I love this one here. Here's the exception. Here's where they make up for it. This is a great one. Okay, this is called um, Wong Zi Chi Watching Geese. Third, twelve thirty-five. Hand scroll in ink color and gold on paper. Isn't that nice? And they got a nice poem there. I'm sure it's a nice poem. That's one of the best ones in there. Oh, that's okay. Showing up okay. That's part of that's also that's part of the Picasso one, right? Cypresses, 1853, oil on canvas. See, they've got one called Cypresses with wheat fields. That's a part of it, right? Oh yeah, that's the love letter one. Okay, that's okay. That looks like a love one. Okay. The Proposal, oh, there's a love story, okay. Oil on Canvas, 1872, The Proposal. Okay, you can see The Proposal. She's thinking about him, she's listening. He's trying He's, he's trying to persuade her. She's considering it. Should she do it, should she accept, should she not accept? Is he, okay. <laughs> you can see her expression. She's She's listening very carefully. Um, she does seem a little concerned at the same time. Maybe she's scared. What do you think? Is she going to say yes? Or is she going to say, let's just be friends? Okay. <laughs> I got a feeling she's going to reject it. Yeah, she, she looks a little sad, doesn't she? I don't think she's going to accept the proposal. Yeah. 18, 1872. By, uh... Bo Guno. Oh, that's nice. Okay. 
Oh, that's nice also. Yeah, see, I, I gotta be honest with you, this uh, collection, oh, this one's okay. The Garden at Vau Crescent. Okay, 1923. Seeing it okay here? Unfortunately, I don't have a view on the back so that I can see. Oh yeah, we did this one before. Here's a good metaphor of the shadow, you see? See how it's split off like that? So much of who he is, he doesn't know. It's like it's split off. You see that? This represents his unconscious, you see? All right? The unconscious has a mind of its own. It has a conscience of its own. It has a voice of its own. It's powerful, you see? And see, he looks kind of bland without his vitality. And see, the unconscious seems to have a lot of... Vi seems to have more vitality than the guy there. You see? So this is called The Stranger Within... Right? The person who walks with you, who's not like you, but who is you, this is a part of him, but he doesn't know it. You see? Right? It's called the shadow soul, or um, the second self, or the secret self. Okay? Somebody's living his life, and he knows nothing about this person. You see? This is a part of him. In literature, this is the motif of the double. You see? This is a part of his mind, okay? This is a part of his memories. His golden ball is in there. His feelings are in there. His vitality is in there. His ability to mourn losses is in there. His ability to know what he likes, his hobbies, his interests, it's, on, it's in this side. Okay, so the metaphors, it's the bag that we drag behind us. Robert Bly's metaphor. You see? So we want to we wanna be integrated. Psychoanalysis means psychosynthesis. He wants to own what he, he wants to own this. He wants to accept this, not reject it. The splitting implies that he rejects all this. He rejects his feminine side, you see, his feelings, you see. So that's what the, so that's, that's the phrase, we live in, we have two minds, you know, this, the conscious mind and the unconscious mind, you see. The mess of love, okay. <laughs> oh yeah, they're having an argument there, looks like. Oh, and the Joker said, okay, and the Joker said to the thief, remember that one, the Jimi Hendrix song? In a previous video, we played the Jimi Hendrix song, and the Joker said to the thief, there must be some way out of here, said the Joker to the thief. Okay, um, love is a secret feeding fire. Yeah, the letter. You know, I gotta admit, this, this collection is sort of weak. I'm not really a fan of this book, to tell you the truth. Oh, the reject. Oh, this one's okay. The Peach Blossoms. That was a nice one. Peach Blossoms, 1859, oil on canvas. By uh, Child Hassam. Okay, here's a nice one. Okay, here's a nice one. That's a nice one, right? What's this? Magnolia and Irises. Tiffany Studios, New York City, 1905. Leaded glass. Oh, that's okay. Palm trees, NASA. Okay. 1836. Watercolor on paper. That's a nice one. All right. That's okay. That's a nice one. Flowers in a Chinese vase, 1906, oil on canvas. That's nice, okay. Monet, another Monet one. I don't know what that is, that's ridiculous, okay. <laughs> Give all to love, yeah. Well, under, okay, the search for understanding, that's a form of love, right? 
understanding, love, forgiveness, it's pretty much the same thing, right? 1800, linen and cotton, that's a nice one. Oh, look at that, that's a nice one, eh? Okay, linen and cotton. Okay. Oh yeah, that's a special. I need to figure out, out a way to hold these all these books here. Olive branch, Egyptian, 1300 BC, painted limestone. Can you imagine, look at that, painted limestone. This is 3,000, 3,000, over 3,000 years ago, somebody painted this on limestone somewhere in Egypt. It's called Aghematon holding an olive branch. Oh. He was a doctor, right? Uh, humanity's one of humanity's first doctors. Right? That's amazing, eh? Painted limestone. Yeah, I like that one. Okay. 3,500 ancient Egypt. Amazing, eh? Okay. The other side here, let's see. You know, I, honestly speaking, there are a few very good ones here, but uh, I'm a little... Uh, maybe we'll revisit that one. Okay. So let's move on to today's quotes. As mentioned at the beginning, and we have other threads throughout this series. Hold on a sec. Okay, so good. The mouse is gone or the crows are gone. So now I can focus back on the quotes. To be honest with you, I was very distracted by the mouse and the crows or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah, they do a lot of damage, these mice. Sometimes they really chew up a lot of things, you know. <laughs> Sometimes I'll wake up in the morning and they, they've eaten some of the wallpaper, like a, a major, like a, like a foot of wallpaper they've chewed on or something. <laughs> okay, let's go, uh, let's continue. Um, let's begin then. So this past hour was sort of um, an overview or an introduction to some of the threads in this series of quotes, 1001 Windmills of the Mind. There are over 30 threads, okay? So I mentioned about it, maybe around a dozen of them in this introduction. Right? It helps us to understand ourselves. These quotes are helping us to understand what's going on, to understand our own behavior, our own motivation, the positive intention behind it, the, the cry for love behind it, right? the cry for mourning, the cry for support to be able to mourn, okay? to understand others, that they're doing the same thing. See, so these quotes are very compassionate. I think it's an act of love, these quotes, um, by these authors. Again, I'm the compiler. I'm not a therapist or anything. And, uh, and especially, I'm not a medical doctor, but this uh, quote here by Sarno, these are from, he, he is a medical doctor. And um, he sort of uh, went on this personal campaign. He went on this lifelong, he had this lifelong mission to go against uh, the medical establishment by saying, hey, come on, guys. Did you know that it's possible that your emotions can affect the body? Why don't you look at this? And they say, oh, no, we don't go there. We just, we're just, uh, people come in. We're just like auto mechanics. We just treat the body as if it were a car and fix something, patch it up. And Sarno says, no, no, the, the symptoms just going to move around. If you, 
You're just playing whack-a-mole with the symptoms, he says. If you're going to squelch a symptom, it's just going to show up somewhere else. Well, then fine, and then come back and we'll, we'll squelch that symptom. And, we'll just, and you're stuck like that. But then, the, then he says, well, the symptom that can follow can be more severe. Well, that's, that's, we're doing the best we can. Cut us some slack, Dr. Sarno. What are you expecting of us? You're expecting too much. Maybe he was. You know, Sarno, um, he's bringing awareness of the theory that our repressed emotions can influence the body, hence the symptoms. Um, but what do we do about it? Can everybody be a psychoanalyst? You know, um, but why don't we, on the other hand, we can create immense relief if we were to teach psychoanalysis in high school. There are 12 therapy sessions in this book. Every high school student should study at least one session a week in the class. Or why not spend two weeks on every therapy session? Okay, so spend 24 weeks on this. So in other words, every in high school, spend one hour a week with this book somehow. That, that, that would create an immense interest in psychoanalysis. A lot of people will continue to study psychoanalysis, right? And um, Sarno's theory is that unconscious feelings can lead to chronic pain. He says chronic pain is a, is a kind of epidemic of a sort, you know? And uh, so it felt to me that he went on, he was in rebellion against his colleagues there, and he was uh, getting very little support. Uh, so all of his books are meant for the, he has four self help books for the general public. Um, and um, in the last video, um, 1736 to 17. Um, Sorry, pardon me, 1763 to 1766. I've covered some of his quotes in that one. And this is sort of a continuation of that video. So again, his, uh, his bottom line is that um, if there's unconscious anger, it's too painful to feel. The, the mind and the brain gives the person a distraction in the form of a symptom. So if they focus their mind on the physical symptom, that distracts them, hence they avoid the more difficult issue of facing the unconscious feelings. That's the main idea here. So he says, and he calls this phenomena of the, he doesn't like the term psychosomatic symptoms because according to him it's too confusing. So he calls it the mind-body syndrome. Okay. Whenever the body, whenever there's a bodily symptom caused by repressed feelings, complicated grief, for example, all that's right, or unconscious anger at the mother, and it's it's stressful. Um, the theory is somehow magically, it's this mysterious leap between mind and body. We don't understand it. He calls it a black box. We don't really understand it. How it happens. Um, but he says that um, these repressed feelings can can get the brain to somehow send less blood to the muscles, hence less oxygen, and the result is pain. Right? So shoulder pain, back pain, neck pain, and other similar symptoms, uh, he says, are caused by the brain creating this distress in the body as a distraction to get your mind off the bigger issue. It's like a red herring. Then you spend your life chasing the symptoms. You squelch the symptom, and another one pops up, and you play whack up. That's like a red herring. So he says that's what's going on. He says, why doesn't the medical community look at that? And they all brush it off. He says, you're expecting way too much. We all can't be psychoanalysts and, and spend two to three years doing a complete psychoanalysis. We can't help people. Um, each person has to be their own existential detective. Each person has to give psychological birth to themselves. Man's main task is to give psychological birth to himself. Now, if he's lucky and he has the money, he can fly to New York, 
Find a psychoanalytically trained analyst, and you can do it in two to three years, they say. Otherwise, you're on your own, pretty much. Yeah. Okay, uh, so this mind-body this mind -body connection, right? this mind-body syndrome, his jargon for it is TMS. Okay? So he calls, instead of calling it the psychosomatic symptoms or the body-mind syndrome, his jargon is, it's tension in the muscles symptom. So T means tension. The M means the muscular, skeletal, tendons and nerves and the is the skosh, skosh, skosha or something. Whatever's related to the muscles and the tendons and the nerves, there's something else there. All of that, and then the syndrome. So he calls it TMS. So TMS means the mind-body syndrome, meaning you have a physical symptom caused by repressed anger. The overly simplified, overly simplified, it's repressed uh, anger or rage that the baby feels that the mother was on the phone for so long. That repressed rage that the baby feels in our memories, in the brain somewhere, in the memories, that leads to a physical symptom. This dynamic, this psychological, physiological, psych psychological affecting the physiological, this dynamic of the psychology and the emotions affecting the body from the psychological to the physiological, this dynamic, this process is called, his jargon for it is TMS. It leads to tension in the muscles and you feel pain there. Okay, so that's, that's his jargon for the body-mind syndrome. So we'll just go with that. It's called TMS. So whenever you hear TMS in the last video and in this video, and in the next one as well, I think I have a few more quotes from it. So there will be three videos based on Sarno's work. So this is uh, the second video of three. Okay, so TMS, what is it? A command decision by the mind to produce a physical reaction or symptom, usually by constricting blood vessels and thereby also reducing oxygen rather than have the individual experience a painful emotion. So my oversimplification of it is, if I understand it correctly, what he's saying is, it's something like this. Your memories say to the brain, so let's personify our painful memories. The painful memories say to the brain, hey brain, I need your help. Well, what do you, the brain says to the memories, the childhood memories, well, what do you want? What can I do for you? Well, I just had a conversation with the person's soul. And the brain says, wow, that sounds important. What did the soul say? Well, the soul told me that there's what's called the innate drive for healing. Okay, fine. And what about it? Well, the soul said that this innate drive for for healing, what it means is that this drive is going to get the person to be conscious of what's unconscious. Now, now here's the problem. Here's the crux of the matter. What's unconscious is that he has the person has this unconscious rage at his mother. The brain says, "Yeah, that that sounds concerning." Uh, go on, and uh, the memory says, "Well." This unconscious rage, it resembles that painting, the scream, in uh, the Edward Munch painting. The brain says, yeah, that, that does sound pretty scary. Um, go on. And the memory says, I don't think the person can handle it, do you? The brain says, oh no, I agree with you. The person couldn't handle that. That's too terrifying. Yeah, I agree with you. No baby can handle that kind of terror of being abandoned and they're going to die and all that stress. That's way too difficult to feel. But the soul told me that, there, that, that the soul's system is going to somehow get the person to be aware of it somehow. Well, they, uh, we got to do something here. He can't handle that. I agree with you. What, what can we do to help this poor person? So the brain says, I've got an idea. And the, and, uh, the memories, the painful memories say, yeah, yeah, I'm listening. What's your idea? 
Well, what I can do is I can restrict the amount of blood flow. I can restrict the blood vessels. Thereby, I can restrict the amount of oxygen to his muscles. Uh-huh. So what? What's that going to do? So he has tight muscles. Big deal. No, no, you're not listening. Listen. Now go on. The brain says, I'll send so little oxygen to his muscles that he'll feel an immense pain. Well, how's that helpful? Why is giving him pain helpful? He's, he's running away from a bigger pain. Well, that's the point. Let's give him a lesser pain to focus on as a distraction from the bigger pain. You mean if we can get him to focus on some lesser physical pain, that'll be a way to keep the bigger pain at bay, so to speak? I think so. What do you think? Oh, hold on a sec. Let me put you on hold. Let me call the soul. Hey, soul, um, what about this? Uh, the brain says we can create a distraction for the person. Will that keep the boogeyman, the... Will that keep the boogeyman at bay? I'm talking, I played the song yesterday from Diana Ross about keeping the boogeyman. It means the, the persecutory anxiety. So the, so the memory says to the soul, will that work? Will, will, can we keep the persecutory anxiety, the scream? Can we keep the Edward Munch painting at bay if we do this? And the soul says, uh, that should work for a while. For a while, it'll work. Okay. Um, well, I'll let the brain know. Okay, hold on. Let me put you on hold. Brain, I just spoke to the soul. What they said is, if you create a secondary pain in his body, right, give him a sore neck or back pain or uh, shoulder pain or tennis elbow or, or uh, knee pain or, or some one of these things, if you do that, if you manage to pull that off, the soul says it'll work for a while. It'll work for a while. So, hmm, but that's not solving the problem, is it? I don't think so. Hold on. Let me put you on hold again. Soul, we're not solving the problem, are we? If we just create these physical pains and these physical symptoms, we're not healing the scream, are we? The persecutory anxiety. Oh, no, you're not. You're just distracting it. I see. Okay, hold on. Brain, yeah, it's confirmed. Uh, we're not going to heal the persecutory anxiety. He, ne he needs a caring witness um, to do all that. The brain says, well, at the time, the way it is now, he can't handle the persecutory anxiety. So I guess we have no choice. We have to distract him. The memory says, well, let's, I guess we have to be on the safe side and let's at least distract him. Maybe it buys time, I guess. For him to, um, maybe it's a wake-up call for him. Maybe he'll investigate why he has this physical pain. The brain says, that might work. If we give the person a physical pain, he might, it might make him curious why he has this physical pain. Aha! So yeah, that's, that sounds reasonable. If we give him this physical pain, he may go to some doctor and say, I got this physical pain. And he says, well, I don't know. I think it's all in your head. Wait a minute. That phrase is very confusing. What do you mean it's all in your head? And then um, he goes to the library. He finds a Sarno's book. And, he, and it means that you're unconscious. Uh, you have a lot of uh, pain in your unconscious. And it's getting your brain to create a distraction. That's what he means by all in the head. But anyways, um, he learns about the mind-body connection. Maybe that's helpful. So the brain says... Um, well, there's some hope in that way. If we give him a physical symptom, it might make him consider the link between mind and body. Right? Yeah, okay. And then if he considers the link between mind and body, then maybe he'll face the persecutory anxiety. So maybe he needs the symptom to get, to get him to the point to be curious enough to regard it as a mirror for him to see that he's repressing unconscious anger towards this baby uh, from what happened to him in babyhood time. I see. Well, it's kind of messy, isn't it? I agree with you. Hold on, let me check with the soul. Well, soul, um, what, do you, what do you think? 
should we get should we go ahead and inst and let the brain create these physical symptoms and the soul says um well if you're telling me the person can handle the persecutory anxiety then i guess i can't think of anything else to do right now how do we get this person to be his own caring witness how do we get him to pick up the the golden feather to look in the mirror to engage in self-reflection how do we get him to uh, you know, search on the search engine for unconscious guilt and childhood trauma and, and, uh, and uh, you know, how do we get them to, you know, re read about uh, developmental trauma and relational trauma and the rest of development? How do we get them curious about these things? Uh, well, maybe this will do it, right? So I'm not sure what the soul's answer would be. The soul is going to say, no, I don't think it's my decision. The soul is going to say, I'm just a messenger. I'm just here to tell you that there's a, an innate drive for healing. I think it's up to you and the brain to decide. Maybe the soul is going to say that. So the, so, the, so the memories says to the brain, well, brain, it looks like we're on our own here. What are we going to do? All we know is that the person cannot face this persecutory anxiety. Then, okay, well, fine, let's, let's give them some symptoms. Until we can, th until, uh, I guess it's, I guess it maybe it buys some time, I guess. The distraction sort of buys some time. Well, why don't we start with a small symptom? How about that? We'll just give him a stiff uh, back and see how that works. Oh, that's a good idea. We'll just give him a little symptom. Oh, so the unconscious memory says, okay, brain, I like that idea. Let's just give him a little pain, not too much. Okay, let's do that. Let's just give him a little ache somewhere. We'll give him a little ache somewhere, and maybe that'll that'll do it. Okay. So, uh, are we in agreement? We're gonna. Are we in agreement that you're gonna want me to uh, restrict the oxygen to some of his muscles, and we'll give him a, some stiffness somewhere? Yeah. Okay, but not too much, brain. Don't don't do it too much. Oh no no, don't worry. I'll just do a little bit. Okay, let's do that. So, the brain. Um, in agreement with his unconscious memories um, by doing some research with the soul and uh, keeping in mind what the soul's instructed said about it so the brain restricts oxygen to the person's muscles now sarno says really do you believe that do you buy that can the brain affect the physiology come on the brain is going to affect and create a bodily symptom so now we can pause for a minute and go to one of his quotes here. Sarno says, if you don't believe this, he says, do I have it here? Maybe it's in the next video. I think it's in the next video. Well, in, tomorrow, in the next video following this, Sarno says, well, if the brain can give us language, if the brain can give us creativity, and if the brain can give us cognition and thinking skills and language, that's pretty powerful. The brain, can, the brain seems to be able to do a lot. Is it that far stretched to... Is it that difficult to imagine that the brain can also... Uh, rest somehow affect the physiology the brain can create language let's see if i can find it here hold on a sec in other words there's a quote that says sarno lists a few of the things about how powerful the brain is and if you keep that in mind that how powerful the brain is it gives us language it gives us creativity cognition it gives us uh it can store all these memories it can do all these things it keeps us going it uh, the brain has an automatic, it affects our respiratory system automatically for us and uh, does all these amazing things for the body. Can't we just assume that it also has the power to send us less oxygen as a, to create a distraction? Because the person can't feel the persecutory anxiety of being unloved as a baby, so we create this, this distraction. Because if he's distracted, then he doesn't, it's the lesser evil, so to speak. 
So he has that kind of argument. I don't have it here exactly, but something like that. So, um, so the brain, um, okay. So the brain creates some stiffness with the hope that the person will say, Hey, why do I feel this stiffness? What's going on here? And maybe that'll be, uh, an incentive for him to consider. Maybe he's under a lot of stress, either from his memories of his, uh, that he's, that he buried or, or maybe there's stress in the environment as well. Can he figure that out? So the body's sending... Um, okay, so I think I'm belaboring the point here. Okay, let's just do the rest of the quotes here. Okay. Powerful feelings in the unconscious were threatening to break out into consciousness. And the pain had to be created as a distraction to prevent them from happening. The brain had seen fit to reduce the blood flow, causing the distressing symptoms. Okay, so there it is there, right? Everyone generates unconscious feelings. Sometimes they are troubling enough to stimulate physical symptoms. Okay, so that's it there again. Feelings that are buried in the unconscious usually because they are frightening, embarrassing, or in some way unacceptable. These feelings and the rage to which they often give rise are responsible for many mind-body symptoms. Okay? So this reminds me of Masterson's axiom. So, real self-activation, activation of the real self, triggers abandonment depression. Now, one of the emotions within that umbrella term, the abandonment depression, is rage. Right? So, doing something that's good for you, meeting your natural wishes and needs, that's going to trigger memories of how when the baby had a wish and a need, he got rejected. That's going to trigger the abandonment depression. You see? Feelings that are buried in the unconscious because they're too frightening, embarrassing, or in some way unacceptable. The baby couldn't handle it. It was frightening, embarrassing, and he couldn't handle it. Unbearable. Right? This, what's, this is what leads to the symptom. This is what led to the body restricting, constricting the blood vessels and constricting the oxygen flow, hence the pain from that. The, for example, the client's shoulder pain was initiated by the brain to serve as a psychological response. Okay. The idea that in addition to speech, cognition, and creativity, the brain can also cause physical symptoms. Oh, there, oh there's that quote I was looking for. So the brain can create speech and cognition and creativity can't we extend that a little bit and think that it, it's maybe reasonable to assume that maybe the brain can also create a physical symptom? If the brain can give us language, can't the brain give us a physical symptom? We can't prove it. Again, it's this mysterious black box about it. But um... Understanding and accepting the nature of TMS is an intellectual process a function of the conscious mind, right? But because TMS originates in the unconscious, the new ideas must penetrate and be accepted there for the pain to cease. Now, the quality and quantity of the underlying emotion determines how long the resolution will take. Okay, so... so so for some people, a person might read the book and they feel some empathy, they feel some validation, and they feel better, and they, f they claim their symptoms got better. Um, but I think, uh, you know, his testimonials are way over the top exaggerated as a selling point. I don't, I don't believe, honestly speaking, I suspect some of these exaggerated testimonials 
People heard his lecture and thousands of people resolved their back pain just by hearing him speak for one hour. And these kinds of um, responses seem a little... I think what he means is people feel some relief at this idea. People feel some validation. Maybe a lot of people secretly had the thought, you know, I don't mind having a, a physical pain because it, it distracts me. Maybe a lot of people had that kind of thought. Now, back in the core collection, one thing that's curious about this, um, way back early in the series, um, also as part of our thread on the body-mind uh, connection. Um, so my thread is called, The Body Bears the Burden, right? Uh, early on, we had a quote where somebody said, I think it's Woodman said this, that the person created a physical symptom to have a teddy bear. The physical symptom served as an object. They can focus their attention on it. They can nurse it. They can be, it can go with them wherever they go. Just like a child carries a teddy bear, a teddy bear wherever he goes, or that Linus character carried that security blanket wherever he goes. A person creates a symptom, and he carries that symptom wherever he goes. And Woodman had that example about the guy with the belly. He said that he was carrying his mother around with him wherever he goes. A symbol of his mother, a teddy bear of his, a connection to his mother. Put it that way. You see. So, so, it, it, so maybe if you hear this idea, oh yeah, okay, maybe, maybe there's some understanding and empathy from it. Um, so that's reasonable, right? There's intellectual insight. It might provide some relief, but usually you need emotional insight. It has to be like an emotional experience to, to heal. Um, so I, I believe Sarno's books can offer a lot of emotional insight. And and who knows? I don't know. Question mark. I don't know. Can a person really um, be healed just by the emotional insight? You know, maybe there's some hope. I think it gives some hope to look further into it. It keeps it in mind. But this quote here actually may be something to consider. He says that, um, okay, the idea of TMS is an intellectual pro. You read the book, it's intellectual. Now he says, what you want to do is you want the ideas to be accepted more deeply. So if you can accept the ideas more deeply, maybe you can... Maybe, yeah, maybe there's some healing that way. I'm new to Sarno's work, by the way, so I, I, I leave this point here as a question mark. Okay, the next one here. Okay, although some unconscious, unpleasant feelings never go away, we continue to generate them. Once we acknowledge them, they lose some of their effect. Being made aware of their existence and the reasons for them is the primary therapeutic ingredient. Okay, so there it is again. He says, if you're aware of the symptom and it's positive intention, maybe that's a part of the therapeutic. A therapeutic. I don't think it's the primary therapeutic ingredient. I think it's a part of it. I think the primary therapeutic ingredient is if you can be your own caring witness or you can have someone else be a caring witness to you. I think that's the primary ingredient. Grief is healed when it's witnessed by a caring other. Grief is healed not from reading a book. Grief is healed when it's witnessed. So you have to be your own caring witness. So these quotes, so Sorno's quotes can help us towards that end, but I don't think it's the end itself. It's just my opinion. Okay, let's go on here. Oh. Are we still recording? Hold on a sec. Yeah, okay. Although, um, here, why don't I just take another little breather here. You know, whenever I talk about Sarno's quotes, I do feel a little... <laughs> I must confess, when I did this video yesterday about Sarno, I was feeling a little triggered. 
and I'm fine. I'm I find myself again slightly triggered by some of this material. That means there's some opportunity here. Since most of the musculoskeletal disorders are manifestations of TMS, any treatment method that focuses on the body will perpetuate rather than halt the pain process. So paradoxically, although the conventional treatment may give temporary usually partial relief, it will often guarantee the continuation of the underlying process because it keeps the client's attention focused on the painful body part. I do not approve of most alternative methods of treatment for this reason. Okay, so there's the whack-a-mole idea. Yes, you get symptom relief, but then it comes out in some other form in some other place. That's his, that's his idea there. We have two minds and must not make the mistake of judging the unconscious mind to be the same as the conscious mind. I must prove to myself that I know what is going on, a tale of my life and my two minds. So each person's narrative is a tale of their life and their two minds. A tale of two minds. The conscious mind and the unconscious mind. Acknowledgement, in other words, the relationship between you and the stranger within. Right? The narrative is about the relationship between you and yourself. Your conscious self and the unconscious self. That's what he means. Okay, acknowledgement and acceptance of the possibility of the idea that repressed painful memories can cause physical symptoms which serve as a protective distraction is essential to recovery from TMS. Okay, so recognize that the bodily symptom is a a defense mechanism. It's a protective distraction. It's a protection. It's protecting you. Your stiff neck, your sore back, it's protecting you from something worse. That's what he means. If you can consider that idea that your physical symptom is protecting you, it's helping you, it's protecting you from something worse. That's the positive intention. It's, it's, give, it's, it's giving you time. It's, it's holding you for you to look at the more painful issue. It's giving you a security blanket to feel safe enough to look at the... Well, no, I'm not sure if we can make that example. But in other words, this, a def every defense mechanism protects us, from ex it protects us from overwhelming anxiety. So it's the appreciation and the recognition that this is a normal, natural phenomena of Homo sapiens to create symptoms and they protect us from unbearable anxiety, right? So the guy who felt unloved and he says other people are so bad, him blaming others and saying bad things about others, that protects him from him feeling the more painful anxiety of how he felt unloved as a child, okay? So prejudice is um, a defense mechanism, right? To protect him from, more pain, from the more painful feelings of how he was unloved, right? Okay. Um, okay. One of uh, one one of uh, uh, one client um, said to Sarno, "I think I know what I'm angry about inside. In fact, I'm sure it has to do with the fact that my mother constantly put me down as I was growing up. So why doesn't the pain go away, doctor? I know what's going on." Why didn't it work? Okay, <laughs> so good question, right? So Sarno's reply is, 
Yes, questions like this are very common. There are three possible reasons for the persistence of symptoms in general, right? One, clients don't realize how angry they are inside. You just don't realize how angry you are inside. He says there may be a blind rage inside, unbridled, uh, voiceless blind rage by the baby inside. People often find this insight very helpful and will see a reduction in pain when they realize that they are in a blind rage inside. Okay? So that's number one, right? In addition to acknowledging the anger, some people need to feel it differently. Okay, in other words, you gotta <laughs> feel it differently. Maybe you gotta feel it more directly. Oh, uh, directly, yeah, there it is there, directly. In addition to acknowledging unconscious anger, some people need to feel it directly. Oh, oh yeah, directly. Okay, um, then if the symptomatology doesn't improve, uh, then they may consider psychotherapy, okay, someone to talk to. Okay, number three, for some people, something other than what they think is stimulating the rage may be the culprit. They too may probably need to work with a psychotherapist. All right. Okay. Next one here. One of the residuals of childhood is the desire to be taken care of. Because we do not view this desire as appropriate, appropriate adult behavior, it is simply repressed. We are unconsciously dependent. Okay, so we didn't get our uh, secure attachment style right, needs. We didn't get our dependency needs met, right? This may lead to unconscious anger because the dependency needs are never satisfied and paradoxically, we may be unconsciously, unconsciously angry at the person or persons upon whom we are dependent, right? So think about the, the thread on, our thread on the stinger and the clinger. A person with a narcissistic pattern never got their dependency needs met. They find a clinger, the fool, right? They're taking, care of, they're taking care of them. They're very nice to them. But the stinger still puts them down. You see, they're never satisfied. It's insatiable. The hate and the greed is insatiable, you see? A person with a narcissistic pattern... They're greedy because they're trying to get the, the love that they didn't get, but no person in the present can be that breast mother. So they're angry about that, so they can be very so they can be angry at the person who's still nice to them. That's the paradox of it all, right? That's why the codependent pattern gives up finally. Then they write a self-help book about it, right? Unconscious dependency may lead to other Angering complications such as poor cho poor choice of mate, okay, someone who will mother us, or choosing a profession or work that will be secure without responsibility, though neither challenging nor fulfilling. Other reactions of the deep-seated feelings of dependency are reaction formation or counterphobic, or counterphobic fierce independence and even prejudice. Right? So he may do the opposite. There's what's called counterphobia or reaction formation. He didn't get his symbiotic needs met, his dependency needs met. That's so fearful. Now there's what's called reaction formation. He'll do the opposite. He'll have an extreme, artificial, rageful independence. Not a healthy independence. It's a rebellion independence. Uh, to to stay in touch with his need for dependency. He expresses it in the opposite, but it's the same thing, it's just flipped, but it's the same. Right? 
that's called so we, we have a thread on reaction formation so may i refer you to our thread on reaction formation for more clarification around that idea okay so this is part of the reason of why there's unconscious rage it's not only trauma it's developmental trauma it's not only situational trauma birth trauma prenatal distress syndrome intergenerational it well intergenerational trauma will lead to developmental trauma so it's relational trauma okay so then you read all the self-help books around that okay faulty development of the inner self early in life leads us with unconscious childish feelings in an adult world And um, he has a quote. Um, in, t in the next video, there's a quote that says um, that a person can be an intellectual genius but still be an emotional baby. So we have a quote by Rinsley. He talks about this. Rinsley asks this question. How is it that a person can be an intellectual genius but an emotional baby? This goes, that links to the Jocasta style of mothering. Some mothers who use the Jocasta style of mothering say to the baby, all right, baby, I'm going to make you a deal. You're going to be fused with me and stuck with me in the negative symbiosis. I'm, you're going to be, I'm going to be your permanent first love. You can marry, but you're not really going to love that person. You can only love, right? The mother may do that because the Jocasta mother uses the baby as a symbiotic object for her. Right. And the mother says, but what I'll do is to preserve my narcissism and grandiosity, I'll support you in getting a PhD. But emotionally, you're tied at mama's apron strings. And that can happen. Risley explains how that can happen, how there can be this split between the cognitive development and the emotional arrested development. So the erosion the emotional development is fixed very early on, but the cognitive development can, sky, can skyrocket. Right? Hence the genius uh, who's at the same time motivated as an angry baby. Right? Lots of examples about that. Iago, for example. Iago, Freddy, he would be like that, right? He would uh, spread rumors and get others against themselves. He's an angry baby. Okay, a couple of more here. The anger you know about and express. Okay, I got to admit, this next one here is a question mark for me. I included it here because uh, I want to think about it. That's why I, I include this next one here. He, he, I think there's something confusing about this one. You see, I think this is Sarno's uh, blind spot. He doesn't, he doesn't uh, talk about narcissism and codependent patterns and healthy personalities. He just, he only talks about the mind-body connection. That's it. You see, he doesn't acknowledge that someone can be emotionally healthy and emotionally immature. Uh, well, if he does, it's only in relation to the body-mind connection. It's only in relation to his theory, but he doesn't broaden it in, in general terms, outside of his theory. That's, that's where the confusion is, I think. The anger you know about and express doesn't cause TMS. Okay? So that's his rationalization for being a sort of an angry man, right? TMS is a response to anger rage generated in the unconscious or conscious anger suppressed. For example, if I have a strong need to seek approval from everyone in my environment and I get triggered by a slight, I might automatically repress that anger because it destroys my image of myself as a nice guy. Okay, the grandiose part self-image, right? 
of him being so special and perfect and all that. His narcissism. He means his narcissism. So he's talking about narcissistic rage here, right? So he got triggered and that leads to, uh, he didn't get his narcissistic supply and that leads to narcissistic rage, right? That leads to displaced anger. Displaced anger. Okay, for example, you become angry at someone, at something else, something simple, like a, like a traffic jam or a poor service in a, in a restaurant, rather than get angry at your spouse or your parent. It's the unknown anger underneath that causes one uh, that causes one to displace, which causes TMS. You see, he gets here's I uh, here's where Sarno is blurry. I think this is his limit. I I think he didn't want to. Um, um, I think he accepted his limits, and uh, and I think he. Uh, didn't want to talk about, you know, that the narcissistic pattern expresses more anger and is rude towards others more than a healthy personality. He doesn't look in that area, you see. But healing would be to reach that area. Healing would be to reach, I'm okay, you're okay. He doesn't talk about development. He doesn't talk about development and object relations theory. Although, ironically, he is promoting awareness of the, un of the existence of the unconscious by emphasizing the link between the mind and the body. That's why his work is very useful. Yeah. Your mind, body, or psychosomatic symptom may continue if you have not established the connection between the physical and psychological events. The last one here. Bypassing, or dismissing, or negating, or ignoring, or uh, disparaging, right, or rejecting. Okay, I'm just going to say here bypassing, right? Spiritual bypassing. Bypassing emotional or psychological health. That's called spiritual bypassing. Reflects a, wor a worrisome ignorance about what is important to good health. Okay, so we all know that good health is not just physical, it's emotional, spiritual, psychological, social. So health is, has a variety of factors in it. The emotional hygiene movement, the mental hygiene movement, the moral revolution, the spiritual re-evolution, all these invisible health areas, that's a part of health. And he says there's a huge ignorance if we ignore that, that side of it. Okay, uh, I just noticed myself, you know, when I talked about object relations theory and our 30 threads, I'm okay with it, I'm comfortable with it. But once I start talking about Sarno's work, I feel a little triggered myself. Because Sarno, his personality, he, he is a bit of a bully himself. And I think maybe I'm reminded of it to some degree. But I value, I very much value that he that he promotes uh, the link between the unconscious and the, and the conscious. But he narrow, very, very narrowly restricts it to that area. That allows him, as a distraction, okay, to focus away from the deeper issue of why he's a bully. He doesn't, he doesn't go there. He doesn't seem like it. You know, bullies can be very charming. and So when you see him speak, he seems kind of, charming and all that but you know underneath uh, he can feel it and he says it in one of his books he says that he he can be very uh, uh tough like that and he talks about his early history and um, so he's he's a tough guy put it that way um yeah he says when he drives he's a rageaholic when he drives he's shouting at everyone and he's you know so Anyways, um, so um, I would say that uh, I'm more focused on, um, I think I think there are more benefits. I think Sarno's work provides more benefits than disadvantages. 
he's a very rare person. His personality, I'm very shocked at it. His, his, don't judge a book by its cover. You, you would never, or I think it's very rare to think that a person with that personality would be interested in psychoanalysis. But he studied Adler and, and uh, Freud and, uh, and uh, is it Charcot and uh, uh, he talks about these people in, in his books. So he studied psychoanalysis. He said he immersed himself into psychoanalysis. You know? And, um, that's very rare. It's very rare to see that someone with his personality would say something positive about psychoanalysis. It's very rare. So I think uh, his four books provide more help than any kind of sin of omission that he offers. He, he omits some very basic things. He, he, he probably... Uh, yeah, I, I, th I have a hunch he, he wouldn't like Melanie Klein and Margaret Mahler and some of these other ones, that, these other theories, because that would expose uh, his hostile provocative attachment style, maybe, if he has that. I think he probably has that. Yeah. So yeah, it was a little triggering for me to listen to Sarno and read his books, and um, but uh, but I'm encouraged at the same time. He he he's a good role model. He's a good example of somebody who's normally a tough guy, you know. He might he might otherwise be a little bit like Mark, you know, but he's uh, he's evolved. He's like an evolved evolved version of him, so to speak. He's a guy who. You know, I think Mar a guy like Mark would look to Sarno as a role model, as a hero. You know, Mark is an aggressive um, person and all that. Okay. Uh, the next video, um, we have a few more quotes on Sarno. And then after that, I'm going to drop it for a while. Um, but, um, but, but I am surprised. Okay, let's play that song where she sings in the song about uh, screaming silence. Screaming silence. That can lead to psychosomatic symptoms. So I'm going to replay the song Self Saboteur by Delirium. I played this song when we talked about unconscious guilt. That was a good song for that. How we self-sabotage ourselves because we have unconscious guilt. So, and we repeat the unconscious guilt to stay loyal to the mother because we're still waiting for her love. And in order to stay connected to her, because we're waiting for her love, we have to stay connected to her. The way to stay connected to her is to hate ourselves or disappoint ourselves because that's what she did to us. Okay, so that, that perpetuated the unconscious guilt. So that's called the self-saboteur in the song by Delirium. But I'm going to replay this song for that, for that lyric there where he says, Screaming Silence. So the screaming silence leads to the rage, which leads to the symptom, and the symptom is a distraction from the screaming silence. The screaming silence is too painful to bear, so we distract ourselves. If we're distracted, uh, then we repress the persecutory anxiety, the abandonment, depression. We, re we repress the voiceless screaming rage. We keep it repressed, and then it manifests itself as a symptom. A symptom is a mirror for the voiceless screaming silence that we couldn't feel as a baby. All the more reasons for mothers to... show a little more respect to their babies. That they're little people. Babies are people. Right. So we have a thread on that, um, on, that, on, that on that area. So when, when the... Ideally, when the baby comes out of the womb, the baby's handed to the mother directly in one motion. And that allows the mother to get in touch with her maternal libidinal availability. It becomes available to her to meet the baby's needs. Yeah. So in other words, the mother gets in touch with her motherlinessness, her, mother, her maternal instinct with the bond. To get the bond, the baby has to be handed to the mother, not separated, not removed. No, no, the cords, leave the cord, leave the placenta. They'll come out later. 
put it in a bowl, it sits by the bed, fall, they fall off on their own accord. The baby's handed to the mother and the continuity of the womb life is preserved. That helps the baby to bond to the mother so he feels safe. So he's getting his symbiotic needs met. And that helps the mother to be in touch with her ability to be a mother. If, that's, if that takes place, uh, there, there's not going to be this voiceless, silent scream. Right. So all the more reasons. Uh, so we had a suggestion in the last vid in one of the videos um, that mothers maybe just stay in bed for a few months, minimum three months, ideally five months. She'll know what it is, right? She'll because of the attunement. She'll know when the baby's hatching out psychologically. The psychological hatching begins somewhere between three and seven months. Mahler says four and five, on average. So she'll know. So why doesn't the mother stay in bed, make herself comfortable, very comfortable, very happy, let the baby sleep on the mother, skin to skin. The baby has immediate access to the breast. Um, he can feed according to his wishes and needs. No schedule, no forced feeding, no demand, no uh, punishing the baby for how he needs to feed. The baby knows what he needs to eat. And that's getting his symbiotic needs met. Mahler calls it optimal symbiosis. The mother has to be, has to optimally, uh, it's a positive symbiosis. It has to continue. If the baby gets that, he's not going to have the hostile provocative attachment style later, in later life. He won't be a bully in later life. Yeah. Because he got his basic trust. Yeah. He developed. He, he got his emotional development. Right? Okay. Uh... A good song by uh, Delirium called Self Saboteur.
Maybe I'm being hard on Sarno. But I think um, Sarno's a good example of what's called sublimation. If I take that premise that he's, uh, you know, um, very aggressive person, power and control and all that, easily slighted and enraged easily. If, if I take that premise, um, he's a good example of sublimation. He used his anger for a socially useful cause. It was, it's, it was very useful for him to write these four books and give these lectures um, about the connection between the unconscious and the, and the conscious. And because he has a narcissistic personality, uh, you know, others take vicarious identification with the narcissistic personality. Because the narcissistic personality is always thinking they're one up. That, sends, that means the brain sends the person serotonin. Okay. So there's another link between the psychology and the physiology. If you think you're one up, your brain sends you serotonin. So, there is, so there's another example of the body-mind connection, right? Okay, again, the narcissistic pattern is the mother is using the child. Okay, so she's getting comforted by the child. That makes the mother feel safer. The, the mother feels safer, okay, because the mother is being serviced by the child. The child's in the one-down position, has no power. And the child is taking care of her, and she's using her power to to get that. So her power makes that happen. Then she feels safer. Then she gets serotonin. Now, in identification with the aggressor, they're going to put others down, uh, and that's how they get their serotonin because that's the way the mother got serotonin. So the person says it's as if a person with the hostile, provocative attachment style, or the narcissistic pattern, or the closet narcissistic pattern, or the Iago character. They're saying, look how, look how I get serotonin, mother in the mind. The same way you got serotonin. What you did to me, you got serotonin from that. I'm doing those things to others, and that's how I'm getting serotonin. See, so that's the negative magic gesture, and they're stuck like that, like Sisyphus. So maybe if, um, so the sublimation is, uh, he, he used his, uh, let's say his narcissistic personality, let's say, or his bully personality, um, and people enjoy his lectures and all that. Right? They see somebody who's getting serotonin through always thinking he's so special and he's a little god, he's so important, and he speaks strongly and demandingly. And listen to me, I'm an infantile god, and you know he thinks uh, these kinds of things. And so he's getting serotonin from that attitude, right? The attitude of that the mother, the mother's attitude of being one up over the child and how she thought that she, she would use her power over the child to get comfort, hence serotonin, and he adopts that. So if he's on stage doing that and you, and you identify with that yourself, uh, they say you can, trigger, you can vicariously trigger some serotonin for yourself. That's why we watch people with the narcissistic pattern, because they're, they're flying they're addicted to, they're, <laughs> right? Um, they're, they're demonstrating the one-up position, the grandiose position all the time. And in your vicarious identification, that's called closet narcissism, uh, you, you stimulate your brain to send you serotonin in your liking of that person. So a lot of people might like him because they're going to get serotonin, right? Now, while that's taking place, he's doing something useful. He's teaching about the unconscious, conscious links. Now, the audience members, many of them don't care about it. They just want to bask in that glow. It's called the closet narcissism. So the closet narcissism is you just want to bask in the glow of the other person's narcissism. You know. So I may refer you to Masterson's work about the closet narcissistic pattern. So anyways, uh, I think... I think that would be a good example of sublimation. So Sar a guy like Sarno used his uh, anger and channeled it, channeled it into something useful for people. It's useful for society for people to be aware of such a thing as psychoanalysis. Right? 
this is a helpful thing, and he's promoting a, he's promoting this, in other words. All right? And not so many words, but he's, in effect, promoting psychoanalysis. And there's pride in that, so you can take pride in doing something useful. So it's a compromise, right? So that's considered one of the healthiest defense mechanisms, the most sort of less harmful defense mechanism, right? Sublimation. So that song was self-saboteur, but um, that lyric I mentioned about screaming silence, it's in another song by, by Delirium. Hold on a sec. I got my songs a little bit mixed up here. Hold on a sec. So let's play that song with um, Screaming Silence. It's called After All. Let's see if we can find it here. Yeah. Is it this one? Yeah, this one here. Yeah, this is the song with the, the lyric, uh, Screaming Silence. A great song. This is the ac acoustic version of the song, After All. Here it is here. There, there's the lyric there. Let's check the other view. Let's see if there's um I don't think there'll be any kind of sunlight, but let's see. How's the view from here? You know, sometimes there's a really a beautiful sunset here. There's the water there. <laughs> so she felt the rage at the at the loss. After all, she's got nothing inside. Yeah, so, so we we've um we've played four songs by Delirium. After all, this one here, Self Saboteur, and we've got two others that we'll play in the future.
Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, this has been TQ 1767, which is a follow up to the video marked 1763 to 1766. And uh, we'll do one more video on Sarno. Um, how about, um, thinking about another song to play. Should we play another de del Delirium song? No, let's, let's save it. That's a good, yeah, that's a very good song. Let's, let's save that. So there's only a couple of minutes left. This is going to cut out any minute. So when this video cuts out, that, that'll be the end, of the, the end of the video. I'm just trying to see if there's any final thoughts about this topic. Um, his messages, his take-home messages, if you're aware of the idea that there's unconscious, voiceless, screaming, unbridled, blind rage in the unconscious, that, the painting, the scream, that's what's causing the symptoms. He thinks if you if you can make that link, if you can get that idea somehow, if you can get, if you can somehow consider that link, he says you can find some relief from that, right? Because it might make you more reflective. It might make you pause a little bit. It might make you oh, understand. Oh, is that why? And then and then you calm down a little bit. So his slogan is think psychological, not physical. If you're always focused on the physical thing, you're just playing, uh, what, what is it, whack-a-mole, whack right? The symptom's going to come up somewhere else. He has an expression for that. Let's see if I can find it. Um, this will be in the next video, but let's see. What does he call that? It's not, he doesn't say symptom. He calls it, oh, it's the symptom imperative. He calls it the symptom imperative. So if you squelch a symptom, you feel some temporary relief, you feel better through whatever you did. Uh, he says it'll come up somewhere else later on, and it might be worse. Right? So he gives examples of people who go from one specialist to the next specialist, and they go to another one, they go to another one, and it keeps on like that. Right? that that's what he calls the symptom imperative. Oh yeah, about the security blanket. So that, not, not from Sarno, but someone said if you have, from Woodman, about the, the symptom being a transitional object or a teddy bear, someone called that a portable security. So wherever you go, you have a portable security blanket. The symptom is a portable security blanket. You don't have to physically carry it. You don't have to physically, you don't have the inconvenience of carrying the blanket you just have the the stiff neck or something. That's that's psychologically being used as a transitional object to reflect, to conceal and reveal the anxiety. It can it reveals it, but it conceals it at the same time. So it's a compromise. They call it conversion. The body converts emotional pain into a physical symptom. Yeah, ligaments, so that's the other one, right? He says the brain can send, um, can deprive the muscles, tendons, ligaments, and nerves of oxygen. That's how it creates uh, the physical pain. Yeah, another difficult topic. But, you know, um, we've had a lot of difficult topics, you know, and... Um, I've tr I'm trying my best to kind of keep it lighthearted a little bit, add some songs and some photos here. Um, what's a good song to end this on here? <laughs> some more Street Heart? 
How about Heartbeat? Have we ever played this one? Here's a good song by Robbie Romero called Heartbeat. Why don't we, why don't we play this one? I don't think we've played it yet. Yeah, let's try this one. Respect for the earth. Respect for the earth? Respect for the water? Respect for the... And why not respect for the body? Respect for the mind? Respect for the... Respect for the body-mind connection. Respect for the body-mind connection. Think psychological. Yeah, so let, let, let's borrow this uh, lyric here. Okay, so this is considered, self-reflection is considered the moral revolution. Wilson makes an emphasis about this, about the moral revolution, that each person is tasked to be their own therapist, to, to respect the body-mind connection. Okay? Um, to to uh, ma man's main task is to give psychological birth to himself. If he didn't get it naturally by the age of three, with a secure attachment style, if the person didn't get a secure attachment style by the age of three, that's not his fault, and he's going to develop all kinds of defense mechanisms, psychological and physical. Symptoms are defense mechanisms, right? Physical symptoms are a defense mechanism against greater pain. A minor pain is a defense mechanism or a distraction, a camouflage for a greater pain. That's natural. We accept that. And it's not the baby's fault, it's not the child or the person's fault. But man's main task is to give is to un, is to heal all this, is to sort this out, to be their own detective. To, to be their own caring witness, to engage in the mourning process and the grief process, to heal himself, to be their own best friend, to be their own existential detective. Man's main task is to, is psychosynthesis, to re-own what they don't know about themselves, to accept what they don't know about themselves, to have a relationship with the stranger with him, to have a dialogue with the um, Sarno has a, an exercise. He says, um, imagine in your mind six-year-old you and say to six-year-old you, you know, you might, you have a lot of pressure to be perfect and good. And you might feel angry. You might, and maybe you're also feeling unhappy and sad. And just have a, a conversation and dialogue with the inner you, the, your inner child of the past. Right? So man's main task is to, uh, And this heartbeat, you know, there's the stranger within has a heartbeat, you know, metaphorically speaking. There's a, a voice there. There's like that, that the image there. It looks like the Picasso one, right? The one with the two uh, Can we find it here? Yeah, this one here, right? So man's main task is to, is to get to know the stranger within. That man there, his main task is to get to know his unconscious self, his second self, his secret self, the one that walks with him, who's not like him, but who is him, right? 
There's someone living my life and I know nothing about him. This is, this is him. And literature's the motif of the double. Psychoanalysis, self-reflection is psychosynthesis. Man's main task is to synthesize what he doesn't know about himself back into himself. And there's an imperative about this. There's this, there's this force about this. There's an innate drive for healing. Here's a good song called uh, The Dream by Rick Santers. One of our musical uh, voices in this uh, series is Rick Santers, either as a solo singer or when he was part of the band Santers. An immensely underappreciated uh, musician, Rick Santers. So the, the Santers, it's just simply called Santers. It's a, it was a band in the 80s. They have four albums. We played a couple of their songs. And then the lead singer, Rick Santers, uh, went solo. And this is from his first solo album. Uh, yeah, his only solo album, actually. And the Rick Santers has a new single. It just came out a couple of months ago called Love Sick. And we've played his song, Love Sick. That was a good song. Well, I think I'm searching for some kind of happy thought to end this video on. He said he had a dream, and uh, in the dream, he heard a melody. It was this song. That's what he says right here. He says, I heard this tune that you're now hearing in my dream. Yeah, it's possible this, this song is about, uh, I'm not sure what it is, yeah. I heard this tune. Here's a nice picture, I like this one. About the owl, that's a nice one with the owl. Okay, detail of a satin panel couched in gold and embroidered with colored silks. Chinese, 19th century. See, that's embroidered with silk, right? Silk embroidery. Isn't that nice? The wise owl there. There's a cat. Cat in the moon. Where's the moon? Oh no, that's the name of the poem. No, that picture there is just a, uh, just a cat. That's a ni another nice one here. Oh yeah, I love this one here. I like this one too. With the poem there about the mountain. And that's another nice one with the mountain there. I don't think you see it okay. These are two very nice ones. This is the most beautiful page in this book, I think, right here. My favorite, well, my favorite page. Oh, the beach one, yeah. We looked at some of these photos in an earlier video. And there's that guy there. Oh, there's the love letter one. There's that Picasso one. Peach blossoms. There's the Sphinx. And there's the, oh, yeah, there's that, there's that nice, the Tiffany, the, the, the stained glass. Can you see it here? Oops, no. That's a hard one to see. Hold on a sec. Let's see. Is it showing up better now? This is a nice one, isn't it? The Tiffany, um, let's see. Oh, sorry if it's not showing too well. This is called, this is uh, called um, Autumn Landscape Stained Glass Window, 
I don't want to drag on the past. <laughs> Lou Graham, uh, classic rock singer from the 70s. Lou Graham, song called That Was Yesterday. We've never, we've never played this one. Not a bad song. We are all homo sapiens. We all... All of us on this planet, all of us are the same species. We're all from the same, we're all of the same common one species, Homo sapiens. And according to one theory, we all evolved from this guy. Homo boduensis. Apparently for one million years, Homo Bodoensis ran around the earth, right? And, um, and, and when he evolved, he became Homo sapiens. And we're all Homo sapiens. So we're evolving. This biological evolution. And self-consciousness, being aware of ourselves and healing ourselves, that's also a form of moral, psychological, or spiritual evolution, right? To heal ourselves. Man's main task is to heal ourselves. Homo botoensis, that was yesterday. We evolved. Homo botoensis uh, doesn't have a uh, cortex. He doesn't have language. We have language. Let's put words to our feelings. Let's talk about... Let's talk so that we can understand. Understanding leads to forgiveness. Forgiveness is the love that we're looking for. Forgiveness leads to the mourning. The mourning is the healing. Right? The willingness to understand and forgiveness are the same. Words are facilitating understanding and forgiveness. Okay, yeah. let's just end with Beatrice Deer here. I would say our main One of our main um, musical voices in this uh, collection of quotes is Beatrice Deer. This is one of her songs called Nalu Ri Rama. So we'll end up with this one. She has a new album coming out in four days. Looking forward to that. Okay, so again, four, there were four episodes of this comic done in 1955. A journey into the subconscious minds of people searching for answers through personal turmoil. This hardcover volume collects the complete run of psychoanalysis, recolored digitally using the original palette and featuring the art by legendary uh, comics talent uh, Jack Kamen with a foreword by Bob Brundle. Okay, so this archive volume contains psychoanalysis issues one through four. Okay, tales of inner turmoil. Okay, it says at the top here, right? People searching for peace of mind through psychoanalysis. This is... This is an educational book. I had this fantasy, oh my god. 
What if this series ran continuously? Let's say they did four, is four issues a year. We'd have, what, 70 plus? We'd have almost 70. We should, what a missed opportunity. This really needed to continue. This should, I think we should revive this. I think the reissuing and reprinting of this is a part of the moral revolution. This is part of the moral revolution, for sure. The moral revolution is to heal, right? The moral revolution is to heal. Okay, thank you, Beatrice Steer, for your wonderful music. Looking forward to your new album coming out in four days. Okay, so um, I guess I'll just leave it here. I hope this has been of um, interest and um, informative. I hope this has been informative. I hope this has been educational as well. We'll wait for the applause. And I'll hit the stop button. Look. <laughs> oh, there it is there. Okay, so thanks again once more. So bye for now. More to follow. <laughs>